Hello, everybody, and welcome to Penguins to Go, your daily dose of Pittsburgh Penguins news and analysis. You can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcasts from. I want to talk a little bit about Brian Russ today, but before we do that, we're going to jump into that with the continuation of my Metropolitan Divisional positional rankings as we break down the best right wings in the Metro Division. Just going to cut through the rankings really quickly because the right wing position is probably, I would say, the weakest in the Metro. The centers were pretty strong. The left wings were extremely strong. The right wings, there are a few names in here of of a couple superstars, of a couple budding superstars, of a couple fading superstars. But overall, I think it is the weakest positional group in the Metro among the five positional groups that we're going to go over. But... Let's go through these starting eight through one. Number eight, I have the Columbus Blue Jackets. Patrick Laine, I mean, if he could ever regain the promise that he had as a 40-goal scoring and as the number two overall pick, maybe they would be higher on this list. But when you look behind him, youngster Kirill Marchenko, a good middle six right wing in Jack Roslevic, and Matthew Oliver. That's To me, when I look at the Blue Jackets, I just have them at number eight. Number seven... The Philadelphia Flyers. A lot of youth for the Philadelphia Flyers, 50-50 on this position. Owen Tippett is their first line right wing, according to Daily Faceoff. Travis Konechny, somebody who really exploded around the 2020 bubble, but has just not continued to grow from there. Uh, Wade Allison is their third line right wing, and Garnett Hathaway they bring in for his first year in Philly. Not a bad unit, but again, I have them at number seven. The Islanders probably have one of the best right wings in the division in Matt Barzal, but behind him, Kyle Palmieri, Hudson Fashing, and Cal Clutterbuck. I've never really been as big on Cal Clutterbuck as most have been, so that might affect the rankings here as well. I also think Kyle Palmieri, when it comes to his age, he's still a good goal scorer. I think he's still a good fit for the New York Islanders, but when it comes to overall Metropolitan Division, I have them at number six. Number five, let's get off Long Island and head down to Broadway as the New York Rangers come in here with Capo Caco, Blake Wheeler, Jimmy VC, and Tyler Picklick. It's going to take a minute for me to remember that Blake Wheeler is a member of the New York Rangers. But I think having Caco there, same thing with Patrick Laine. Is he ever going to really get to the level that you expect from a second overall pick? I'm not sure. This is a big year for him. Can he separate himself? Because as of this moment, at least from the outside looking in, I see Capo Caco is part of a good young third line. And that's that's really all I've seen from him at the NHL level. Again, from the outside looking in, but still, I have the Rangers at number five. Number four, this is where I have the Penguins. And really, I could have put them as low as six, but I think four is probably the peak of where the Penguins could be this season at right wing. Ricard Raquel is coming off of his first full season with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He was fantastic last year. I'm not sure if you can expect more from him this season, but I will say that even if he levels off at where he was last season, which was 60 points, 28 of them being goals and being a really good first-line winger for Sidney Crosby, that's still a win for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Brian Rust, the second-line center, we'll still talk about that here in a little bit. Jeff Carter is the third-line center on Daily Faceoff. We're actually going to talk about him a little bit more on tomorrow's full episode of the Tip of the Iceberg, so make sure you tune in for that. I'm not sure he's going to be the third-line right wing, but according to Daily Faceoff, that's where he's at. And then Matt Nieto, the new face, comes in as the fourth-line right winger. So, again... Very top-heavy for the Pittsburgh Penguins in this position, as it is in a lot of their forward positions. But I think the right-wing spot is where there's a massive difference between the top six and the bottom six. It's most noticeable at right wing. I have them at number four. Number three, I have the Washington Capitals, because this group is a group that if all things go well, it, it could be very dangerous. And it could be the best in the Metropolitan Division. But I'm not dealing in ifs right now. If Tom Wilson can stay healthy for a full season. He was on pace, an 82-game pace, I should say, for over 30 goals last year, despite only playing in about 30-some games. Same thing for TJ Oshie. 
He was on pace to have over 21 goals last season if he played a full season, but he wasn't healthy, didn't play the full season. Anthony Mantha, since going to Washington, it just hasn't worked out, but you still have that pedigree with him that you can expect to potentially come through and be massive for them in a third-line role, which would make the Washington Capitals that much more deadly. And then I like Nick Obey-Kubel, their fourth-line right wing, obviously a Stanley Cup winner with the Colorado Avalanche, and somebody who plays his role to a T. So I really like the Capitals down the right side. Number two, Hurricanes with Seth Jarvis, Marty Natchez, who is somebody who I really enjoy watching play hockey, Jesper Fast, and Stefan Nason. It's solid. It's the Carolina Hurricanes. It's a bunch of names that casual hockey fans aren't going to know, but hardcore hockey fans are going to look at and say, man, that is a solid, solid unit. And uh, I'm going to say it's solid enough to be number two in my positional rankings. And at number one, the New Jersey Devils. I'm sure when I get to the end of this, whether that be later this week or early next week, depending on the news cycle for the Pittsburgh Penguins this week, (coughs) Eric Carlson. If I get to the end of this, I would assume doing this golf score wise that the New Jersey Devils will end up winning because they'll have the lowest score out of everybody. Ranking one or two in all these positions, Dawson Mercer, Tyler Toffoli, underrated addition for the New Jersey Devils this summer. Then they got Alexander Holtz, the youngster, and they brought back Nathan Bastian. I really like that right wing side. So eight Blue Jackets, seven Flyers, six Islanders, five Rangers. Four Penguins, three Caps, two Hurricanes, and one, the New Jersey Devils. But before we go, I do want to talk a little bit about Brian Rust. I think people are going to be surprised by his season this year. Going to be one of the things that I'm going to be most bullish on heading into the season, that Brian Rust is going to have a great year. I think the addition of Riley Smith is going to be extremely impactful for Rust. I've said that multiple times. On multiple different episodes of Penguins to Go, of Tip of the Iceberg, I've said it on guest appearances on Locked on Penguins, I've said it on guest appearances on Around the 412, both great shows, you should check them out. But I also think that he was better last season than many people think. He still scored 20 goals despite everybody saying he had a down year. And on the surface, it appeared that he did have a down year. But he played significantly less time at 5-on-5 compared to his previous seasons where he was considered to be a breakout player for the Pittsburgh Penguins when he was considered to finally be a top six player for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Last year, 2022-23, 9% of his total ice time was played shorthanded, and he scored 20 goals in 81 games. The year prior, he played only 4% of his total ice time shorthanded. He scored 24 goals in 60 games. And the year prior to that, he only played 2% of his total ice time shorthanded. He scored 22 goals in 56 games in that season back in 2020-21. So over the past three seasons, you have seen Brian Russ take on much more responsibility with a massive jump last season because the Penguins lost Zach Aston reese at the trade deadline the year before. They didn't retain Evan Rodriguez, who was a big part of their penalty-killing forwards. Teddy Bluger started the season injured, was traded at the end of the season. Ryan Paling was also injured. They needed penalty-killing forwards. Brian Rust, for everybody saying he's a jack-of-all-trades, and and they're 100% right. I mean, this guy is lauded for his ability to play in all three phases of the game, and he should be, and that's not a bad thing. But when playing that much time on the penalty kill takes away from the five-on-five production... That's when it becomes an issue. But here's the thing. The production was taken away at 5-on-5, not because he played worse because he was putting so much effort into it. It was simply because he was playing more time on the penalty kill and less time at 5-on-5. Jay Fresh, who was very respected around the hockey world, put out an interesting graphic yesterday. It was the top 40 players who created the most and the best Scoring opportunities last season at 5-on-5. All that statistics were, of course, compiled from, I believe it's called all three zones. Let me double-check that real quick. That way they get the proper allocation. Yeah, all3zones.com. Brian Rust ranked 35th. 
in the entire National Hockey League in scoring chance creation. 35th. You know who he was right below? Andre Svechnikov. You know who he was two spots above? Jason Robertson of the Dallas Stars. Somebody who was considered to be a breakout star last season. An all-star. Somebody who is now one of the faces of an organization in the Dallas Stars that is considered to be right now one of the strongest organizations in the National Hockey League. And building. Brian Rust outperformed him when it comes to creation of scoring chances. For reference on that top 40, Sidney Crosby was ranked third in the NHL last season. Jake Gensel was ranked 16th. Evgeny Malkin was ranked 22nd. And like I mentioned before, Brian Rust ranked 35th. So at 5-on-5, five five, Rust was one of the best scoring chance creators in the NHL. His numbers dipped a little bit simply because he played more time at four on five with the addition of Riley Smith and more defensive minded forwards in the bottom six. Brian Rust, in my estimation, my expectations, Brian Rust is going to have a significantly better year in 2023 24. And that means only good things for the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's going to do it for this episode of Penguins to Go. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And remember, you can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from. We'll see you guys next time.